and Dan's locker was by the far side. You come in this door and Dan was all the way on the far end. And I walk in, he's the first person I saw. And I like, I'm like, I almost pissed down my leg. I'm like, holy shit, that's Dan Marino. Hey everybody, what's up? Trey Wingo here. Welcome into another episode of Half Forgotten History. Season five, we're once again partnering with my good friends at Mercedes-Benz. We're gonna have great conversations with great athletes and talk to them about the things that they had to overcome in their life to achieve their dreams. Speaking of dreams, thanks to my friends at Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans, I found the perfect way to get everybody to the golf course or to a tailgate or just get out of the house. Look, whatever your dreams are, Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans can help bring them to life. This week's guest is a Hall of Fame NFL player who, when he first tried to work out, couldn't even lift the bar when he did a bench press. Safe to say he figured that part out. That's why he's in the Hall of Fame. Here now is my conversation with longtime Miami Dolphin legend, Jason Taylor. All right, let, let's start here because this is so unique for you. What's it like being a first ballot Hall of Famer and knowing potentially, potentially, you might not even be considered the greatest player out of your high school? <laughs> well, first of all, there is no potentially. I'm not the best high school player out of my high school. Gronk obviously is. He had a bigger career in high school. I played so late, but yeah. you know, being the first ballot Hall of Famer kind of gets me a leg up on Gronk until he's done playing, and then five years later he'll he'll retake the throne as the greatest player from Woodland Hills High School that is also a first ballot Hall of Famer. So for yeah. the next, who knows with Gronk? I mean, he might retire for four years and come back, but for the next however long, I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, for people to understand, like Jason played at Woodland Hill, Hills High School outside of Pittsburgh. And here's the list of NFL players that have come out of Woodland Hill High School. Rob Gronkowski, uh, Quentin Jefferson, longtime defensive tackle, Miles Sanders, who's now playing uh, for the Philadelphia Eagles, and a couple of names that people might know. Ryan Mundy, who played a lot of years in the NFL, mostly with the Steelers. Lusaka Polite, who was a running back that played for half the league, I think, yep. by the time his name was done. Terrence Johnson, Steve Breston, you guys were a real pipeline to the NFL. Uh, we were. Our, our head coach, our former head coach, who's retired now, George Novak, was uh, he was amazing. He was one of those guys that was all inclusive, would bring guys in that potentially didn't understand they had potential or, or maybe needed developed, um, gave a lot of guys a chance. You know, but I played, I played in a different era, too. So I played in high school, obviously, from 90 to 92. I led our team in receptions my senior year with 13. So that tells you how much the game has changed. We ran the ball right. We ran it left. We ran it up the middle. Yeah. We ran it right again. If it was third and long, we'd throw it. So, but he was a uh, he was an amazing guy. He, he's really the guy I credit for getting me started playing football because I was a basketball guy all my life. I never played organized football until I was a junior. One of the few juniors that played on the JV team because I could not see the field as a, on the varsity. But uh, patience, uh, understanding the process. I don't think I understood it at the time but yeah. trusting the process and tr trusting Coach Novak to have a vision for me. And he's the one that taught me into playing football in college. I, I never really thought I ever had a chance. So how did that process begin? Like I knew you, you people that know you went to Akron also may not know you played basketball there as well for a while. Right. So how was it making that transition from thinking I'm a basketball player to I'm going to be a football player and I can't get on the field even though I only have one more year left after this? Yeah, I mean, as a basketball player, that was pretty good. You know, you're used to playing and being on the field and being one of the guys. And, you know, not getting that opportunity in football was – it was difficult, I guess, but it's different than today's athletes. So, I think back then we were more patient. We were more understanding of – or more trusting of, of our coaches and, and the system as a whole. And, you know, you, you keep chipping away. I'm the ultimate competitor. I, um, I love to push myself. I love to practice and, and find things I need to get better at. I understood. I didn't know what, what was going on. I mean, there would be JV games where, you know, I'm playing safety and there would be a flag thrown. Okay, I understand there's a flag. Everything stops. The referees talk and then they're going to announce it. And they would give the hand signals, whether it was holding, illegal procedure, offside, whatever it was. I didn't know what the hand signals were. And I had no idea what the call was. So I would just, I kind of, I'd play it cool, but I would kind of look at the rest of the guys and I would just follow the herd. The herd started yeah. moving this way. I would just move that way. They moved this way. <laughs> so it took me a while. And and listen, I grew up in Pittsburgh. So everybody that, that's yeah. born and raised there is a huge Steeler fan. So yeah. I remember I watched every game. I was a big Steeler fan, but I didn't understand football in that way because I was so ingrained in basketball. So I had patience. I had determination. I had a very, very competitive spirit. And going into my senior year, I was, I was determined to figure out what the hell this football thing was. How can I get myself on the field and, and be able to start on both sides of the football? 
So what did you end up doing your, your senior year? What was, what was the thing that got you over the hump and sort of got you to where you wanted to be? Um, I worked my ass off. I really did. I, I, I did all the off season program, you know, I got in the weight room for the first time and, and not in a major way, but at least introducing myself to a weight room and being there, um, being around the guys, listening to football terminology, you know, listening to the calls on both sides of the ball, you know, tr- wanting to play both, both sides of the ball un- understanding that I have to learn this stuff. And now it wasn't very difficult. Um, yeah. you know, now being, being in the game for 20 some years, I mean, it, if you look back and it wasn't very difficult, but for a new person, for someone that was so, you know, such an infant in, in, in football, so to speak, I, you know, I had to just absorb it all. And I would stay after, I would run sprints. You know, I, I used to run very flat, never ran up on, on the balls of my feet. And, you know, I remember coach always saying, get off your heels. And I'm like, what does that mean? Get off your heels. You know, and there was before Google, you couldn't Google what does get off your heels mean. So right. You, just had to, you had to figure it out. And, and that's just, that's what I did. You know, I lived in, a, in an area in Pittsburgh that had a ton of hills. I would run hills because I heard Walter Payton ran hills. I had no yeah. idea why. I had no idea how to do it. I had no idea how it was going to translate. But Walter Payton did it. I want to do it. So I, I just kept doing that and, and, and learning the game. As I got bigger, stronger, and faster, I wasn't very big. I mean, I was 175 pounds when I came out. But I got faster. I had really good hands. Um, that was a, that's the basketball background with the eye-hand coordination. And, and just I worked. I was at everything. And I would always want to stay after and have the quarterback throw me balls. And I remember the backup quarterbacks would be like, why? Dude, we don't even throw the ball. Why are you so worried about yeah. catching the football? I'm like, well, there's going to come a time where they're probably going to have to throw it, and I don't want to drop it. So that was that yeah. was my thing. And just so people understand, I remember you telling me this once. You were so like un- you, unaccustomed to weights. Like when you started lifting for the first time, you just used the bar, right? There were no weights on the bar. Yep, uh, not my proudest moment, but <laughs> but yeah, there was there was. I uh... live that moment every day. Okay, <laughs> I live that moment every day. So you're good. There was a long moment of time where it was just the bar. Like when I was benching or squatting, it was just the bar. I remember I got to the University of Akron as a freshman. And right when we first get there at the beginning of training camp, we're doing testing. I think it's like a day or two before training camp starts. We're going to do testing. Yeah. So we all go in the weight room and they split it up. You know, the skills, as I, and I went there as a receiver. So the skills, you know, do 135 and they rep it out. I'm sorry, do 185 and rep it out. And then the, the, the mids do like 205 and then the bigs do two, 225 or 275, whatever it was. So everybody gets on, the skills are all doing the 185 and they're repping it out. And some guys are, you know, getting five, some are getting eight, 10, 12, you know, they're celebrating the 10 or 12 at 185 pounds. And I keep moving to the back. I'm like, you know, who's up next? And I would move back one more, you know, just buying time. But, you know, you're kicking the can down the road, but eventually I got to get my ass on that bar to, or that bench and do it too. Right. So I lean over and I tell one of the assistant strength coaches, don't even know his name, didn't know anybody yet. And I'm like, hey, I, I, I can't do 185. I, I I, I can't lift that weight. He was like, all right, we'll strip it down to 135. Just put a 45 on each side. And I'm like, to myself, I'm like, shit, this might not work out well for me either. <laughs> so everybody everybody goes, and I'm like, I, I got, I need 135. So they take, the, they take the 25 off. I got 135 on the bar. I lay down. Everybody else counted. Everybody else that laid down, and you know, they get all set, put their hands on the bar, yeah. and they start counting. Three, two, one. So I figured everybody else did it. Let me do it. Three, two, one. They take it off the rack, and as soon as they take it off the rack and let go, but I'm like, oh shit, you're <laughs> you're you're getting that tremble already. So I bring it down, hit my chest, and I got pinned. Well, we didn't have the collars on the sides. I get pinned, yeah. so I'm I'm trying, and they're like everyone screaming, push, 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 and I'm pushing, and I'm twisting. Oh, you ever see a guy in a weight room like twisting the bar? Yeah. yeah. One of the forty fives fell off on the on the left side, and it snapped it to the right side, and the other one fell off. And, the, and I'm sitting there holding the bar. I fall off the bench. Everyone bust out laughing, and that was another moment for me. That was, yeah. you know, I mean, that was a humbling moment. And from that day on, I was in the weight room for at five o'clock in the morning before anybody else was. I didn't want to embarrass myself, but right. I was determined that was never going to happen again. Yeah, that, that's a great story though, right? Because a, a lot of people would either be a so embarrassed that, wow, shit, I'm not doing this anymore. Or B, figure that a guy like you for the career that you had, you know, you're in the 100 sack club in the NFL, that, oh, it always must have come easy, right? Nope. It's important. I think it's really important for people to hear stories like that to realize nothing, nothing comes easy for anybody. If you want something, you have to put in the work. Yeah, and that, that's, you're absolutely right. And that's everything. I mean, whether it's athletics, it's business, um, you know, being a, being a father, being a husband, whatever it is, you, you've got to put the work in. I mean, the easy part is to join the team. The easy part is to find a girlfriend and, and, and fall in love or, or let's get married. And then you got to work at it or you know, being a father, you, know, you, you have a kid and 
everything's great. All of a sudden the baby comes out and he's screaming and you're not getting any sleep. It, it takes work and everything you do in life. And listen, nothing was easy for me. And, you know, sometimes as a kid, I look back and I'm like, you know, damn, my mom is struggling. We don't have much money. We, you know, I don't have much opportunity. I, I feel like you're stuck in this, this, you know, these, these four walls of your concrete jungle neighborhood. I'm like, you know, people get discouraged by that. They get disenfranchised sometimes because they don't see the hope or they don't see an opportunity. And, you know, you, you never know when that opportunity is going to come, come about in life. That's why I was always determined whenever it comes. And if someone used to tell me all the time, you're going to get an opportunity at some point, someone's going to give you an opportunity, whether they're, they're visionaries, they're, they're very, very smart or they're stupid. Either way, they're going to give you an opportunity. Don't be the, don't be the reason you can't capitalize on it. So listen, life was tough. Um, yeah. Coming up was tough. Learning football was tough. Getting to college was tough, to the NFL, to the hall. It's all, it's all tough because if it was easy, everybody would do it. There would be a million right. people out there doing the same thing. And that's what's so, so unique about what I got to do for a living is that it's very few people. Only, you know, they always say only the strong survive. I think only the determined, the hardworking, you know, the committed, you know, the ones that are willing to overcome adversity. I think those are the ones that survive. Yeah. And again, as you said, you started out at Akron as a wide receiver. Obviously, you were drafted for your defensive prowess. When did that transition take place? When did they say, hey, like, I know you have great hands and the basketball thing, but we'd like you to do this. Um, shortly after that, that uh, bench test of 135 pounds that failed, <laughs> we, um, well, it was probably a week in the training camp, maybe, yeah. maybe eight days in the training camp. We had, uh, we had a scrimmage. So I'm lined up outside. I run a slant. I catch the ball on a slant. And again, not understanding football, not understanding the, you know, what the defense is doing and where the, where the holes are in the zones and all, all those different things are route running. I catch a slant while well, the corner's coming, the safety's coming down. I'm going to run away from the corner and the safety. So I'm running away from the corner and the safety. But the problem is there's a middle linebacker sitting in the middle of the field. Didn't oh. realize that. Um, there were no defenseless receiver rules back then. Nope. You know what happened back in the 90s when you came across the middle. Yep. It happened to me. My helmet went one way. The football went the other way. I probably did something in the air and came down, fumbled the football. So the next day I go in the meetings, offense is on this side, defense is on that side. And we always had to leave our playbook in our meeting room because they were worried about guys losing it and misplacing it. So the meeting room was always locked up. Your playbook stayed on your chair. So I walk in the next day, I go to my chair. Somebody else's playbook is on there. That's weird. I look at the next next to me on both sides. It's not there. And someone's like, some, some one of the kids was like, no, I saw yours over there on the other side. So I'm like, no, I, I go find it. And I bring it back over to the offensive side. There's no chairs left. So one of the coaches walked in. He's like, nah, your ass is over there now. I'm like, over there where? He's like, you're playing defense. And that was, that was me playing. I went to free safety for a few weeks and then ended up moving to wheel linebacker. First of all, that had to suck because, you know, that, that's a, another cold slap in the face. But <laughs> yeah. But but when, during that process, did you start to get it? Because obviously it must have clicked pretty quickly because, you know, you, you rose very well in terms of all-time records at the University of Akron on the defensive side of the ball. Well, I got redshirted that first year. So that was, that, yeah. was, my, that was my chance. And, and you know, I, I tell my sons now, one who's in college and one who's going to be a freshman next year, and, like, everyone's – that's like a bad word. It's like a four-letter word to everybody, redshirt. And yeah. it was to me in 1992, too. I, I didn't want to be redshirted because, you know, the, the scrubs get redshirted and everybody else plays. Well, it, it's exactly what I needed. I mean, I needed that extra year to develop. I was 17 years old when I went to college. So I was, you know, I, I could have been, could have had one more year of high school. And that development year of your maturation physically and mentally and, and emotionally yep. is such, it was such a big thing for me. So, again, I didn't love it at the time. Um, looking back, I'm thankful for it, but it was just a year for me to work. So you're still practicing. You know, it, I had a whole issue with being homeschooled where I was declared ineligible by the NCAA because I was the first uh, homeschool player to get a scholarship. So that, that took a month or two out of my freshman year too. So the red shirt was perfect for me in so many ways. And I got a little bigger. I got stronger and faster. That was the biggest thing for me. And, and, I, and I was able to understand the game of football from a more cerebrally than, than just playing, you know, athletically. So uh, then you go on to really excel at Akron. Um, what was your thought process about where you might be taken going into the draft that year? Well, before that, even, I, you know, I, I started playing wheel linebacker, was playing well. Um, my yeah. junior year, I think it was my junior year, I was uh, honorable mention All-American out of Akron. It's, you know, it's difficult to do. So it was 
So people started coming around, started getting noticed, and started getting a lot of scouts to come to practice and things. So you start to understand, well, maybe they're looking. They're looking at me, and this could be that opportunity. Whether they're geniuses, you know, they're visionaries, or they're, or they're dumb, they're going to give me an opportunity. Let me make sure I'm prepared for this. So going into my senior year, I'm, I'm jacked up. All right, I have, you know, I, I participated in the pro day for the seniors that were there the year before. They let us run, and that's kind of what splashed me on the scene, plus having a, a decent junior year. So I come into my senior year, and I'm going to be a real linebacker, returning, honorable mention, All-American, which is kind of like a participation award, but whatever, I'll take it. <laughs> so I'm like, Here, here's, this is my chance. Well, our, our defensive end goes down, I think, in the first game, might, maybe even training camp, our defensive end goes down. Our starting defensive end, they say, well, we need someone to move to the defensive end in the meeting. And I'm like, shit, I know who it ain't going to be. It's not me. Yeah. I'm, I'm 200 and <laughs> – maybe 215 at this time. I'm like, I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a real linebacker. And, you know, the coach called me aside, called me over and we talked for a while. And he was like, listen, we need you to move to DN. It's better for the best for the team. We, you know, the team needs it. I think it's a great spot for you, um, for your future to be better. And I'm like, no, I, I want to play linebacker. I'm, I'm finally understanding some of this and, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting pretty good at it. I want to stay here. And then he, he put, I remember he printed out, he printed out a piece of paper. This was in 1996. And, you know, the numbers were way different than they are nowadays. But, you know, he showed me quarterback salaries in the NFL, you know, linebacker salaries, tight end salaries, free safety salaries, right defensive end salaries. And I'm like, oh, well, shit, this is starting to make a little more sense. Maybe I should go down there and give us a <laughs> shot. So I went down to right defensive end and, and, and had a pretty good senior year. And, and really my biggest game was against Virginia Tech when they had Jim Drucker Miller and they were like yep. number three in the nation or whatever. And that kind of put me on the scene. So that kind of catapulted me into having a chance to go to the NFL. And when those guys started coming around, you know, it's, it puts, a, it puts a lot more pressure coming from a school where it's not normal to have that many scouts around and, and that, that presence at every practice um, put a little more pressure on, on me. And I think sometimes I was probably pressing a little bit in my senior year in practices and in games, you relax, you just go play, but in practices, you're always trying to make that impression on, you know, on the Steelers scout or the, or the Bengals scout or whoever is at practice that day. So it was, Again, that was a great moment for me to, you know, block out the noise. Because, you know, when, when I was at Akron, we weren't playing in front of 50, 80, 100,000 wow. 100, fans. It wasn't a huge atmosphere. So that, that atmosphere, I think, uh, of those guys being around helped me prepare for what was going to come, you know, if, if and when I got drafted. I still had no idea if it was going to yeah. happen, if it was going to work out, but it wasn't going to be for a lack of effort. Jim Druckenmiller, a name that still gives shakes to a lot of San Francisco 49er fans. Um, so well, why don't we take a break right now? and We'll come back and talk about what happened after the Dolphins made you the 73rd overall pick in the 97 draft. We're, we're talking with Jason Taylor, Hall of Famer here on Half Forgotten History. Stay with us. We're coming right back. Overcoming the odds, rewriting the playbook, delivering under pressure. The MVPs of small business lead their teams to victory all year long. And Visa is proud to provide playmakers everywhere with more tools to help grow their business and help them achieve even greater success. Because the more people we can empower, the more we all win. Visa, a network working for everyone. All right, back with Hall of Famer Jason Taylor on this episode of Half Forgotten History. So you get drafted in the third round by the Miami Dolphins, uh, and you go to Miami at a very weird time. Don Chula has literally just retired, and mm -hmm. it is a brand new era of Miami Dolphins football. What were your expectations going in as a rookie? Uh, football expectations were, in my mind, I'll be honest. I mean, I got drafted as a, in the third round you know, by Jimmy Johnson, who is a, you know, just an amazing guy, amazing coach, yeah. amazing evaluator of talent. But you know, this is this is the big leagues. And, and the weird thing is, first of all, for me, growing up in Pittsburgh, as I said earlier, I was a huge Steeler fan, but I was also a Dan Marino fan. Because when, when the Steelers were playing that afternoon block, you would get yeah. the Dolphin, you would get the Dolphin games. And you know, Dan Marino being a Pittsburgh guy, right? I was I was a big Miami Dolphin fan, big Dan Marino fan. So first of all, getting drafted here was was amazing to me. I'm like, you know, God loves me. He put me in a, in a good spot. This is exactly where I wanted to be. So I felt very fortunate. And then you get here. And you know, it's sunny. There's palm trees. It's a whole different atmosphere. The, the culture is totally different. It's a melting pot of from Hispanics to blacks to whites to, to, to Jews. I mean, it's, it's a melting pot of everybody. So it was a culture shock in some ways. And I'm like, holy cow, these people do exist. I've heard about them on TV. Like this is this is amazing. <laughs> I've seen them in, 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 you know, in TV shows and movies. This is amazing. 
then you got to walk in the building. So one of the first people I saw when I walked in the building was Dan Marino. So I remember walking in the locker room and Dan's locker was by the far side. You come in this door and Dan was all the way in the far end. And I walk in, he's the first person I saw. And I like, I'm like, I almost pissed down my leg. I'm like, holy shit, that's Dan Marino. So I stopped and I went back out the door and I went around the locker room. We had to go to the training room to get physicals or whatever, check in. I walk around the locker room because I was too afraid to walk past Dan. <laughs> so as I'm walking around the locker room to go to the training room, there's another door right there by Dan's locker that leads out to the same hallway. Well, Dan walks out in the same hallway. And first thing he says is, oh, Jason Taylor, what's up? What do you have? And I'm like, oh, shit, I've arrived. I don't care what happens yeah. in, in, in my career. Dan Marino knew my name, knew the high school I went to. So that, that obviously eased a lot of anxiety. You know, he shook my hand, introduced himself. And so I eased a lot of anxiety. But my expectation was to you know, come in, and I'll be honest, it was to let me do everything I can to cover kicks. I'll be on a yeah. kickoff team, kickoff return, punt team. Punt. You know, getting on the field and playing defense – in in my for the Miami Dolphins in the National Football League was was kind of an afterthought. It wasn't an afterthought. It was it was a it was a lofty goal that I thought I had I would have to work hard to. Which I had to, I still had to work hard to get there, but yeah. it wasn't in that it wasn't in that immediate immediate vision for me. But Jimmy Johnson, if he's you know for all the great things about Jimmy, he's not afraid to play a young guy. And you know, and yeah. I was coming through a team that had just played. You know, they, he had just played Zach Thomas for in his rookie year at middle linebacker and, and really, you know, he released his veteran Mike going into training camp the year before. So, you know, Jimmy will give you a shot. And he, yeah. and he told me, he's like, listen, you don't, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about the call, the coverage, this and that. You're going to learn all that as you go line up on the right side in a five technique or, or a nine technique or a seven, which the seven technique didn't work out for me. I kept going to a nine technique until they finally let me stay there. He's like, just go get the football. Just go when the ball snap, go get the ball. Hey, whoever has the ball, we'll teach you the rest as we go. And that's what I did for, you know, for training camp for a few weeks. I was playing behind Daniel Stubbs uh, oh, out, of my, Daniel out of Miami Stubbs, for a yeah, while. Yeah, out of Miami, yeah. And he was making me do everything, making me carry his pads, and he would make me take reps in individual. But in goal, in goal line, you know, Stubby had to go get his thumb taped, or he had to go yeah. – he busted a shoelace or, yeah. you know, in middle drill. But if it came all time – yeah. All the veteran moves. All the veteran moves. Exactly. If it came time for, like, third down drill, oh, he's fine. He's healthy. He's in there. But I had to take all yeah. the grunt work. But the grunt work that he, that he was making me do in my rookie year against Richmond Webb made me a much, much, much better player. Yeah, for those that don't remember, Richmond Webb was an outstanding offensive lineman for many, many years for the Dolphins. You know, it's funny, I, I'd forgotten the Jimmy Johnson scenario here. I imagine he looked at you in a lot of ways the way he looked at Darren Woodson uh, as a guy who played a different position a little bit in college, but saw a rangy, fast, athletic player that he had to find a way to get on the field. Was that, would that be a, 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 a accurate comparison in your mind? Yeah, abso- yeah absolutely. And that, that's exactly, and, he, and he'll tell you so. He's like, listen, you're going to get... You're going to get bigger, stronger, and faster. You know, I was a 242 pounder, really probably about 238, but I used to drink. For all you football players out there, if you drink one of these before you get in the scale for weighing, that's a pound. So I, would, I, so I would drink like five or six of these before I got in the scale and then be all waterlogged and stuff. Did the same thing at the combine, drink a gallon of water before I got on there and pick up eight pounds. But he was like, look, you're, you're going to gain weight. You're going to get stronger. You're going to get faster. You're going to, you're going to understand the game more. But. I'm going to give you an opportunity because you're too good of an athlete. I'm going to put you on the edge, use your length. You know, he's like, use your length, use your leverage, play fast. What the hell does that mean? Use my length, <laughs> use my leverage and play fast. The play fast part I can understand, but use your length, use right. your leverage. But I, I didn't understand how to do that. But I had great veterans around me too. I had guys like Trace Armstrong around me, Daniel Stubbs around yeah. me. Um, you know, play, again, playing against Richard Webb every day, you start to realize when you're getting your ass whooped on a daily basis by Webby, you start to realize, yeah. oh, this is leverage. If I'm lower than him and I use my length and I set it down to use my long arms and he can't get to me and I hold that point better, oh, this is – so it start, you start to develop and learn these things, you know, kind of on your own. But you can't do that if you're not given an opportunity. And, and, and Jimmy gave me that opportunity and kind of, you know, the old cliche of throwing your ass in the deep end and you're either going to sink yeah. or swim. He threw my ass in the deep end. I started on opening day and it was either sink or swim. But, but he was always there to kind of give you a – so that life preserver if you needed it. This just in, you're a pretty good swimmer. Um, so, uh, you know, th- the other thing which I find really interesting when we're, when we're talking with you, you had the Jim Druckenmiller moment in college. That's when you thought, hey, maybe I'll get noticed and I can do this. Was there a moment either in that rookie year or in training camp where you thought, shit, I might be able to really be good at this? 
Uh, yeah, there was. And it was – it really wasn't until our first preseason game. Um, Brett Favre had just become the highest-paid player in NFL history, and, and, and we were playing him in the preseason game. And I ended up getting – one or two sacks. I ended up sacking Brett at least once, maybe twice. It's been a long time now, but that was kind of my moment where, where like, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling this. Like, I, you, you feel, you start to build a little bit of confidence. I'm still a 21 year old kid. You got a lot to learn, but I can compete. You know, I'm practicing against Webby every day. Dan Marino's throwing the rock, I'm playing for the Miami Dolphins. I got, you know, the great Zach Thomas behind me, a lot of good players around me. Sam Madison came in with me and, you know, I got Sam Madison playing the right corner, chirping in my ear, you know, instilling that confidence because he was so confident. It started coming around that that really that that first preseason game. And then, you know, as I started going through my rookie rookie season, you know, it it starts to build and you're like, shit, I I, I belong here. Now I'm here. I don't want to be a guy. I don't want to be here for a cup of coffee. I want to be here for a long time. And how do I do that? Well, it, it, you, you you figured it out. I mean, the numbers are, are, are what they are. You know, you're 139 and a half sacks. Uh, you're in the 100 sack club. You, you were first ballot Hall of Famer, Walter Payton, Walter Payton Man of the Year one year. But you mentioned Jimmy Johnson, and, and you went through some coaches, okay, in Miami. You know, Dave Wonstadt goes down there. Uh, and, and then, of course, the Nick Saban experiment. And I think this is interesting because we're going through – uh, somewhat of a similar scenario in the NFL this year with Urban Meyer, who's learning really quickly that there's a quantum leap between college ball and coaching college kids and coaching men in the NFL. What was your reaction and your thought process when you learned that Nick Saban was going to be the Dolphins head coach? Um, honestly, I was elated. I was happy. I mean, I, I you know followed Nick Saban in, in college. Obviously, LSU had won the national championship, so his name's all over the place. And you know, he, he was the hot name. He was a hot guy out there, and, and he chose to come to Miami. To a team that, that was, and I think, different than Urban's situation, Nick came to a team that was, that was pretty good in a lot of ways. Yeah. And we had a good defense. Uh, we needed to get the quarterback situation figured out. Uh, needed a few more pieces here and there, in the, but, but inherited a much better team than Urban did in, in Jacksonville. So um, my only reservation was when Nick came here first, he, he wanted to move me to – you know, that three, four hybrid stand-up guy moving around, playing the jack position. And I had been a, what well, that was 2005, so I'd been seven years, six or seven years of my hand in the dirt playing right defensive end. Yeah. So that was my resistance at first. I was like, I, I'm not standing up. And I remember having a conversation with my agent, um, Gary Richard at the time. And, and you know, we, I was like, Gary, I, I don't want to stand up. I, I just made the Pro Bowl being a defensive end, and, and I've been doing this for a while, and I feel like I'm, I'm you know, perfecting, mastering my craft a little bit. And this, all this talk was that, you know, Coach Saban kept saying, you know, I want to stand up. We're going to be variable in defense and multiple moving around and this and that. And I remember I was going to, I was going to the Keys. I had a boat and I'm taking my boat from Fort Lauderdale to the Keys. And I'm driving down there and Gary was like, you know, Coach Saban wants to talk to you. And I'm like, well, and I was kind of being a hard head. I'm like, I'm not standing up. I'm not standing up. And he was like, he wants to talk to you and talk this out. So I said, well, he can give me a call. I'm on the way to the Keys. I got a five hour ride. He can call me. So Coach Saban calls me, and we talk. As I'm driving the boat to the Keys, he's he calls me, and we talk for I don't know at least an hour, and we're talking what he wanted to do with me at first, and then you know I told him my reservations for to it, and he started explaining you know what the defense could be and how it works. So we start talking about coverage, we start talking about you know multiple fronts and getting down four down, three down. We had this great philosophical talk, and and personal you know a personal intimate talk, and I, and I was probably two hours into my ride, two and a half hours into my ride at the key, to Key West. And I was ready to turn the boat around and go back to the facility at, at that moment and, and get to work. And, and so he, he, instilled, he, he instilled the confidence in, in the scheme. He was like, listen, you could be, you could be a, a pro bowler and a Hall of Famer playing this position. And I'm like, well, I'm already a pro bowler. You know, that, that's, that, that's that pride and that ego. Like, I'm already a pro yeah. bowler. And I'm like, you could be a Hall of Famer. And you know, let, me, let me trust this guy. Let me trust, let me trust the system. He talked about his process, which he still preaches to this day. And he had me so fired. I was so ready to go. And to this day, and I, and I tell everybody, you know, he, he left Miami and, and people down here don't like him or hate him or whatever, have, have their opinion of him. There is no football coach walking God's green earth that I love more than Nick Saban. And there's no, there's wow. no person. There, there's, there's very few people walking God's green earth that I love more than Nick Saban. Coach Saban is that special to me. He's, I tell him all the time, every time I see him or talk to him, how much I appreciate him, um, how much I love him. He is not for everybody. Yeah. But he is—he was an amazing person for me, an amazing coach. 
took my football acumen from from here to off the charts. Um, I still talk to him all the time. I mean, he's he's recruiting my son now, ironically, and it's uh, you know, I, I work with a guy. You know, I'm coaching down here in high, in high school, and I work with a guy that used to work for coach. Um, he does say I'm I'm me, the coach and I are battling for the biggest asshole um, as far as the coaches. <laughs> so at least at least I'm in at least I'm in Coach Saban's uh, atmosphere in some way. But he is he is a very very special guy to me and. Again, not for everybody. He's tough. He's yeah. tough on people, he, but he pushes you. He has a he has a, a a process, a standard, and that standard does not change regardless of where he's at or who he's coaching or who's coaching for him. And I love that about him. Yeah, I, I find this interesting on a lot of levels because it infamously really didn't work for Nick mm-hmm. in Miami. And I remember, I can't remember if it was after a game or a preseason game or a practice, and Nick got up there in front of the press and said, "Look." Honestly, I don't care if we win or lose. I want to make sure we get it right. And that caused so much of a stir that day on NFL Live, and we talked about it on that show, that Harvey Green actually set up a phone call between (laughs) me and Nick to explain what he was trying to say. And I'm like, I hear you. I understand the process. But at the end of the day in the NFL, we're not building a program where you have players for three years and then they move on. The only thing that mattered was wins and losses. I mean, like that, right. like if all the shit that Urban Meyer is going through right now, if they were five and oh, you know what they'd say? Oh, Urban, he's so yep. weird and quirky, you know? Yep. So it, it's interesting to hear you say that because he did rub a lot of people the wrong way when he was in Miami. He did. And he, he was, he's tough. I mean, we, you know, we went yeah. from, from Dave Wonstadt and Jim Bates was the, was the interim coach for a, yeah. minute and, for a while. And you know, you different personalities and I, and I love Jim and Dave to death, but, you know, Coach Saban was so different. He was just, he was a different personality. He was, he was rough around the edges in some ways. I think in the way he, way he taught the people sometimes, the way he coached, he was very intense, very, very detail oriented. And there was times like we'd go to walk through early on when he was here, we'd go out to walk through and, and, you know, we'd have our, we'd have our tennis shoes untied. You know, we're walking through in the indoor facility that he finally got built down here in Miami and, and he, and he'd lose his mind and start going crazy over us not having our, our shoelaces tied or, I think he tried the, the, the shirt tucked in thing for a while. That, that didn't work out. When you got Junior Seau and, <laughs> and, and Vonnie Holiday and Kevin Carter, some of these veteran guys, yeah. you know, Jason. Nah, he's taking my that shirt in. Nah, yeah. Nah. But, you know, it, you take, if you take a step, I, I took a step back and I'm like, he's going crazy about our shoes not being tied or walk through. This is a 30 minute walk through on a Saturday before a game. Like the haze in the barn already for Sunday. Yeah. We're, we're just polishing it up and we're done. But you start to understand why those details mean so much. And for me, it was right up my alley. For some people, it was a turnoff. It, you know, for some players, for some coaches, for some people in the organization, and um, the way he, the way he, you can kind of handle and 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 dictate what the media does in college versus what you can do in the NFL, was probably a transition and a change. He had been in the NFL before, not as a head coach, yeah. but no, long time assistant. Yeah, and then and then he, you know he obviously after a couple of years he he left to go to Alabama. Now one of the biggest things here that a lot of people that have come through Miami have made a mistake with. What at the time was Drew Brees. You know, we didn't we didn't draft Drew Brees come out of college. And then we had a second shot at it, and we didn't we didn't ask Drew Brees didn't to pass his physical. Dance. Yeah, didn't yeah. pass his physical. And, yeah, and that that kind of changed. You know, not having a quarterback, an established quarterback for a long time after Dan Marino left. You know, with Jay F- Jay Fiedler did a great job for us for for a few years, but not having that dude for yeah. a long time really put us behind the eight ball. And and I think. The team that Coach Saban inherited in, in 05 and 06, even though we started out rough in 05, finished really strong at the end of 05, struggled in 06, and then you know he, he left after at the end of 06. That was a team that, you know, with a few more pieces, particularly that guy in the center, I, I really do think we could have won a, we could have won a championship with with uh, with Drew Brees at quarterback and and Coach Saban as a head coach. Well, you know, quite honestly, you could make the argument the Dolphins are still looking for Dan Marino's replacement, and you just hope that Tua, yep. if he can stay healthy, can be that guy. All right, let's take our second break. We'll come back. We'll, we'll finish up uh, with Jason Taylor on his, his career in the NFL and then what he started to do post-career, uh, which was interesting and entertaining on a lot of levels. We're back with, with Jason Taylor right after this. No two dreams are the same, but there is one van equipped to handle them all. For over 120 years, Mercedes-Benz vans have been built, upfitted, and ready to go because we believe dreams should never stay that way because those who find their passion drive their passion. So you can stop following your dreams and start driving them. 
Back on this episode of Half Forgotten History with Jason Taylor, and we're brought to you by our friends at Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans, who helped make your dreams come true, and your career was in many ways a dream. Yeah, you know, I want to go through some of the things that, that happened when you played. You know, you, know, you were a, a Defensive Player of the Year, Walter Payton Man of the Year, three-time first-team All-Pro, second-team All-Pro, six-time Pro Bowler, member of the 100-sack club. But I think the most unique thing about your career in terms of your play was that you hold the record for most touchdowns by a defensive lineman with nine. Now, what do you attribute that to? Is it some of the ball skills that you had when you were a basketball player? I mean, that's a lot of touchdowns for a guy that's not supposed to touch the football. Um, it, there's, I guess there's a few things that go into it. I mean, being around the football is, yeah. is a short answer, but it's, it's an attention to detail in, in your work. And I've always prided myself on that. That's part of the reason why you know, Coach Saban and I I think clicked in a lot of ways is he was so detailed and, and you're always trying to find a way to take the next step. So being a great pass rusher was great. You're knocking the quarter, or tackling the quarterback when he has the ball is great, but I, I forget who it was. I, I want to say it was Trace Armstrong, but it, it might've been somebody else it told me, you do realize, and I tell the kids I coach nowadays, you do realize you don't have to tackle the quarterback for it to be a sack. Because defensive ends, you get you get judged on sacks. There's a tackle, Correct. there's a tackle line, there's a missed tackle line, there's a sack line. You gotta have you gotta have a number in that sack line, or you're not gonna be around very long as a as a pass rushing defensive end. But you don't have to tackle the quarterback to do that. It doesn't have to hit the ground. Knock the ball out of his hand is considered a sack. But guess what else you get? You get a forced fumble, and then the ball's on the ground. You have a chance to pick to recover that fumble, and then you get a chance to use your athleticism because most of the fast guys are downfield. You got to make five fat guys and a quarterback miss. You pick it up <laughs> and, and run it back. Like it's, and, and yeah. you know, I, I always say, you know, sacks end series, turnovers change games, turnovers for touchdowns, cha- you know, win you games and changes your legacy. And I, and I was always in practice when I would work after practice, which I did every day, working after practice or even during practice. An individual, we all, I always had a ball. I always wanted a ball yeah. associated with me rushing a quarterback, whether we were doing one on one pass rush. And the equipment manager was sitting back there. Don't just stand back there. Hold a football. I'm going to practice. I'm going to practice. Not, I'm not going to hit your arm or break your arm, but I want to yeah. practice while being engaged on a block, reaching and finding that football in the pocket, wherever it is in the pocket. You know, I, I did ball drills every day. I pick up, I, I would do scoop of scores every day, practice bending at the ankles, ankles, knees, and hips. I'm not bending over, you know, straight legged and falling forward, which you see so many guys do nowadays. You know, guys bend over forward to pick up a football. But, you know, they end up stumbling forward or they kick the ball forward or they fall when they pick it up because they're not bent at the ankle, knees, and hips. I did that every day, Trey. I did it every day. I did it before games. In pregame warm-ups, I would be over there with the DBs after, you know, you do your two or three plays of the little mess around team thing you do. It was always a ball involved. I always, I always had a coach designated to throw me balls. And I would catch 15, 20 balls before, before a game would start. Just getting used to when that pigskin comes around, don't panic. People yeah. panic when that pigskin comes because for some reason it draws so much attention on the football field. That's why they call it football. It's the most important thing out there. How can I be comfortable being around this pigskin anytime it comes around me and be able to pick it up and change the game and change, change your career? Well, listen, uh, it's not just the touchdowns. Eight interceptions, 46 forced fumbles, 29 fumbles recovery. You got very comfortable uh, around the pigskin. But it's also a process to get comfortable to play. And there's – I, your story is not unique, but it was one that was told about the things that you had to do sometimes to get to play in the NFL and be there for 15 years. And, you know, there's the stories of, you know, your, the issues with your feet. Sometimes they, they hurt so bad. You, you know, you had to sleep. There were issues with your body. You had to, you had to sleep standing up because it was the only way you felt comfortable. And, you know, we've talked about this before uh, on the show you know, every day in the bat latter part of your career, before every game, you'd go down to the bowels of the stadium and they'd shoot Toradol in your feet. And you'd have to bite down on a towel just to get through that so you can get out there to play. I, I think people need to understand, like, it's a dedication if you're going to play as long as you did to go through the things that you put your body through. There, there's a tremendous physical toll that the game of football takes on you at any level. But particularly in the NFL, if you're able to stay around, and I was blessed to stay around for 15 years, you know, there's there's decisions you're gonna have to make. There's there's times where you don't feel it, you don't feel good, you you know, you're hurting. You you get you kind of get used to, you know, that old cliche of get comfortable being uncomfortable. Well, that's that yeah. that that pertains to playing on the field, being with the media scrutiny, your preparation, but also physically how you feel every day. You're you're always gonna be uncomfortable. I still am to this day. Every day I when I wake up, but there's also a difference between being 
injured and being hurt. And, and it's a personal decision, I think, for every player, how much you're willing to push your body. I did not like missing games. It was just as simple as that. And I was blessed to go nine, over nine years without missing a game. And then I, you know, I went to Washington and had some issues up there with, with some, with the compartment syndrome and, and staff infection and that whole disaster for a few weeks. But yeah, I, I, I had plantar fasciitis for a week and then I tore my plantar fascia in my left foot in a game. And then I tore the plantar fascia in my right foot the next game. So I've got back to back weeks of tearing plantar fascias in my foot and anybody has had to go through it, plantar, plantar fasciitis or tearing them. It's brutal. It's almost, it's almost debilitating. You can't really move. Yeah. So I wouldn't practice during the week. I would do the, you know, I would stand out there for walkthroughs. I'd sit on the golf cart for walkthroughs, and I had to get, I had to get, uh, you know, numbed up before before games. And I remember we played. Coach Saban was here. We we played the first time it happened. We played in, played the New Orleans Saints in Baton Rouge, after after Hurricane Katrina, when when uh, the Saints were displaced and had to play in Baton Rouge. At, so we're playing at LSU, and, and you know, obviously Nick Saban used to coach there. And I'm down in a lot in the, the visitors' locker room, which is. You know, anybody that's ever been in the locker room, the home one's really yeah. nice. The visiting yeah. one, not so much. Yeah. Yeah. Tiger Stadium down there in Death Valley, the visiting locker room's not very nice. I'm in this old, dingy, like musty room away from everybody because the doctor told me, he's like, listen, we'll do this for you to play. It's going to be a process to figure out how much we put in. You know, you can't go too numb because you can't move. If you're not numb enough, it's going to hurt. You can't and you can't run. So it's going to be several injections. We have to wait for it to kind of set in. And I remember going, and he's like, but it's, you know, all doctors lie. You're like, oh, it's not yeah. going to hurt, not going to hurt. And he was like, JT, no. this is going to be, this is going to be the worst pain you ever felt. I'm going to let you know. Okay, so ju ju yeah, just so people understand, like, you're right. Most doctors say this won't feel like, he yeah. up front said, this yep. is going to suck. Yeah. I mean, doc I'm not going to say his name, but doc the doctor said, yeah. this is going to be the worst pain you're ever going to deal with. And I'm like, oh, I'm good. He's like. It was like, you know, now you might want to grab a towel or something and it, so you, know, you, could, you could hold on to it, scream into it or bite it. And I went and got one that looks just like this one. It's not, this is not the same one, but I went and got a Gatorade <laughs> towel and I held it close. And then as soon as he touched that needle on my foot and went in, I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was the worst I've ever, ever, ever had to deal with. And I had to do that for probably five or six weeks to the, you know, and it was, it was a lot that game and a little less and it slowly got a little better but i had to finish the season out doing that and then i had back issues that i had to get you know several epidurals um to be able to play in 06 um you know more than you should get and, and again it's that physical toll that you that you're you make a personal decision if, if you're willing to go that far and i was always willing to go that far because there was nothing better than being on the field in an nfl game on sundays at one o'clock or whenever the hell they want to kick it off if they, if they yeah. plug the scoreboard in and turn the lights on, I wanted to be available and, and I was willing to put myself through whatever it was needed to be out there. Jason, you mentioned a lot of names of great players that you played with in Miami, but I want to get your opinions about one guy that you were really close with for a lot of years, and that's Zach Thomas. A lot of people think he belongs in the Hall of Fame and he's come up so short for the last couple of years. If you could say something to the Hall of Fame voters that would sway them to put Zach in Canton, Next to you, what would you tell him? I'm a first ballot Hall of Famer, and I would not be in the Hall of Fame in the first ballot or ever if I didn't play with Zach Thomas. If I didn't play with Zach Thomas, and then there's other guys you can include in that, you know, a guy like Pat Sertan or, or Sam Madison on the outside playing corner, Brock Marion, you know, back deep at safety, Brian Walker. I had a lot of great players around me, Tim Bowens up front, but Zach Thomas was the heart and soul of the Miami defense for the entirety of his career in Miami. And, you know, I got more headlines. I made some splash plays and sacks are sexy and touchdowns are sexy, but Zach Thomas is the hardest working, best football player I've ever seen, period, end of story. And there, there is no, you put his numbers up against guys that are in the hall, whether, you know, I'm not gonna, I don't need to name names and, and, and right. make it personal between guys, but you put his numbers up against anybody in the hall and you tell me why he's not in there. He, he absolutely belongs. And he is, he made me, he made me such a better player. All of us better players could, he prepared like no none other. He, he, he was the first one in the building, the last one to leave. And people say all oh, those are great things. You know, he was he prepared, he worked hard, he this, he that, he overachieving. That's fine. But when you get on the football field and you dominate the way Zach Thomas did, and you yeah. put the numbers up, and you have the results, on, on, and, and you have it for a long period of time, his longevity, and a, another guy that was undersized. I mean, there's nothing to talk about. It's it, it's it, it's to me, it's a no-brainer. You know, didn't didn't grab as many headlines as, as some other guys, or or as, as much as I did. Um, no fault of his own, but he absolutely deserves to be in, in Kenton.
and one of the most giant cinder block heads in the history of the NFL. Like yeah. <laughs> that thing, I mean, he, he looks like he Barney really Rubble is. out there, man. That 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 head was made to play football. There, there's no question about it. And um, he is he is one tough son of a bitch. You're talking about yeah. someone that's going to hit you, and and I've seen Zach bite through mouthpieces. I'm talking about yeah. teeth go through mouthpieces because he's out there he's out there denting face masks all, all game, and it just. I mean, I remember seeing him hit Jerome Bettis on the goal line. We were playing down here in Miami on the goal line stand. I think it was fourth to one. Everybody in the world knows 90, 99% they're going to hand the ball off to Jerome Bettis, who's built like, you know, his nickname is Bus. Yeah. They yeah. turn around and hand that, hand that some bitch off to, to Bettis, and Zach met him at the goal line. And Zach went, Zach went backwards this way. Jerome went backwards this way. And it was, a, it was a turnover on downs and one of the most amazing plays I've ever seen. But that was just him every day. Every day, I think he's part of the reason why the the, the, the rules were changed about going across the middle. And you know, yeah. guys, I, I've seen I've seen Zach, and the, and the guy used to coach down here in in Miami as a receiver coach, and, and I joked with him about it when I saw him. I've seen Zach Thomas knock a receiver out back in the old days, coming on, on a slant, and that whole thing where you say, "Oh, they had snot bubbles." It was the first time in my life I've ever seen literal snot bubbles coming out <laughs> of a receiver. His hands were stiff, his legs were stiff, and he was blowing snot yeah. bubbles. Yeah. That, that Zach Thomas was a dude. Yeah, it's it's not a thing. I mean, it's not it's not made up. It actually is. It's something that happens. Yeah. Um, and here's hoping that Zach will get the call sooner rather than later to be where he belongs in, in Canton, Ohio. Um, you got the chance to decide when you wanted to stop. And I remember when we 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 had you on NFL Live. We played that that moment, uh, the last locker room moment of your career. The speech you gave uh, to your teammates. Um, that's never easy. Like no. I, you knew going into the season, probably it was going to be last year. You knew going to the game, it was going to be your last game. But when the reality hits, like you said, there's nothing you'll ever do in your life. That'll give you the same feeling as running out on that field to play in the NFL. How difficult is that as a transition for a guy? Like, as you said, at the start of this is, is an Uber ultra competitive dude. It was very hard, you know, very, very difficult moment. Um, I'm grateful for the moment because I knew <clears throat> I actually knew, <clears throat> Excuse me. I knew, uh, I guess, two weeks, three weeks before the end of the season. Um, Miami was not going to bring me back. I didn't want to. I didn't want to go somewhere else. I was considered a progress stopper for Cam Wake, even though I wanted to play yeah. uh, another year or two. Could have probably could have limped through another one or two. I knew going into that last couple of weeks, it was the last one. And you know, the build up personally, internally, for those two weeks was I was trying to. I was trying to take advantage and, and cherish every moment. Of those last two weeks and then there was that part of it there was a lot of regret that there were moments that i didn't cherish for the previous 14 and three quarter years you know i'm like shit this is coming to an end now i want to stay in the building longer i want to be around the guys until the last one leaves i want to enjoy those those late, late night road trips you know even though you, you know you're grumpy yeah. sometimes you're coming back it's late you lost whatever it is and i want to enjoy the, the treatment i want to enjoy, enjoy the process of getting your body together all the things that that pain you and, and tax you and, and take a toll on your body, you know, throughout the course of a season, I want to cherish and hold on to all those moments now because it's almost over. So I had, I had a, probably a two week buildup. Um, again, talking to a guy like Trace Armstrong, who was retired at the time and Trace and I talked a good bit before the announcement was made that I was going to retire, but I, but Todd Bowles and was a head coach at the time, the interim head coach at the time, another guy I love to death, you know, the defensive yeah. coordinator in Tampa now and, was hoping he would get the head coaching job and, and maybe try to finagle my way to come back for one more season. But, you know, he, you know, it, it was the, those two weeks and Todd was, Coach Bowles was great about, you know, he wanted it to be as much about me as I wanted it to be. And it was up to me. And it was, for, to me, it was a no brainer. Like, this is about the team. Like, I, I want to win going out. I appreciate anything the organization is going to do or the players are going to talk about or the media is going to do for the next couple of weeks. But I never wanted to make that announcement because I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted to be about the team. And Todd was like, you want to address the team. You want to be the only captain to walk out. What do you, what do you want? This is, this is about you for the next two weeks in a way, even though it's still a team thing, I want to make it, you know, I want to make it as grand for you as you're willing, as you, as you want. And I told him, I was like, I don't want anything. I, I, we're playing the Jets in, a, in my last game as a, as a pro. I want to beat the Jets. That's all I cared about. And it was, but those, those moments, man, I, you know, pregame, driving to the stadium, you know, you drive a little slower. I end up, I end up, you know, I have a back way where I come into the stadium, you know, a player, player lot access. And I didn't take that. I went all the way around the stadium. I drove all the way around the stadium one time. Then I came in the main gate. I wanted to see the people at the main gate one more time. 
and and I would see them from time to time going into games, but I wanted to see them one more time. And you know, you walk, you drive by, and put your window down. And they, you know, they all go crazy and say hello and good luck today. And I wanted to give them a moment. I wanted to, I wanted to have a moment with the security guard, the, you know, the security guards at the players lot one more time. I wanted to, you know, with my, with, with you know, with, with the personal security guard. I wanted to have, I wanted to enjoy that last day with him. You know, walking slowly into the stadium. You know, walking slowly out to the field and taking in pregame warmups. You know, taking in all the things you take for granted. You know, yeah. being around the trainers, the managers, the, the the lady that would bring cookies down from the suites before games. She'd bring down cookies and brownies for years. You take that for granted. You know, you don't really you say thanks, you say hello, but you don't you know you don't spend that 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 intimate time with them because you know this is your last one. So, you know, seeing her for for fifteen seconds one last time, and then when the game was over, thank God we won. You know, play against the Jets, who were a big rival for the Dolphins. Play against a team that I had played for previously. You know, the year before. You know, and seeing Rex and those guys. So it was great to end my la- my last game being against a team that we hated in Miami, but also were, yeah. were teammates of mine. So I had guys on both sides. And then Paul Solei, Cam Wake, and, and uh, Kendall Langford, for whatever stupid ass reason, they decided to pick me up and carry me off. And that <laughs> that that did it, man. That was tough. That was that was yeah. a, that was a tough moment. And uh, yeah. you know, that, that final that final moment in the locker room, you know, having a chance to address the team, hug Coach Bowles, hug all the guys. I mean, that was I was the last one to leave the stadium that night, and the game was over at four o'clock. I don't think I left the stadium until shit. It was probably eight o'clock, eight thirty. Everyone was gone, yeah. and you know, I was sitting there having a, having a couple of drinks with you know, and talking with the owner and 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 the uh, some you know my teammates and former players and Dan Marino and man, you don't want to leave that stadium. It's when you leave. Yeah. Folks, when you leave, it's and it's over. It's over. It's yeah. it's over. Well, listen, I I just love that locker room speech after the game, and, and it was one of my favorite moments, uh, sort of encapsulating how I thought of you as a player, and I think how a lot of people thought of you as a player. Listen, you've been very generous with your time, so I want to wrap this up with a couple of rapid fire questions. Is there because oh. you were sort of a trendsetter, okay? Like you, you know, Lamar, a bunch of two hundred twenty pound guys coming out of college that played a 244 that were supposed to be wrecking balls when you came out. Now it's more common. Is there a guy in the NFL that's playing the position now that you think, hey, he reminds me of me? Uh, before I answer that question, I have to go back to what you just said is so true. They used to call us tweeners. Remember that yeah. back in the day? When yeah, tweeners, tw- yeah. And that, that would be a bad thing in the draft. Oh, hey, my he's a God. tweener. I'm not sure. Yeah. Tweeners, it was such a derogatory term. Like, it was so bad. You don't want to be called a tweener. Now they call them hybrids, and they pay them $20 million a year. Like, it's, <laughs> exactly. it blows my mind. Every time I see my mom, I'm like, Mom, why couldn't you wait, like, 15 more years to have me? the perfect timing, making $20 million bucks as a hybrid. But anyway, let's go back to your question. Uh, is, yeah. there a guy that, is there a guy in the league now that's, uh, yeah. that reminds me? Um, you know, I, he's still he's bigger than me, but, I, you know, I see a guy like Chandler Jones. Um, yeah. You know, he's a, he's a beast on the edge. You know, there were guys that played in, in the same in the same era as me, like, you know, guys like Terrell Suggs. But, you know, there's very few guys that, you know, back then that could do it at 245 pounds. And I, always, and I always took pride in doing that. Everyone said, you're too small. And they would say it in my 14th year. They would still say it like you're too small to be doing this shit. And I'm like, well, wait till that ball snap and watch this shit. Yeah. Talk to me when talk to me when the when the when the clock hits zero and we'll see. Yeah, if exactly. still feel the same way. The quarterback that you never sacked that you wish you had gotten to. Ooh, that's a good question. Um. I mean, Dan Marino. I think I got most of the other ones. So it'd be Dan. That would have been it. That would have been it. Dan Marino, be, being a yeah, you know, he was he was the greatest quarterback of all time, in my opinion, until Tom Brady took it over. But um, yeah. being a teammate, not being allowed to touch him, and growing up watching yeah. him, if I would have was on another team, I would love this Zach Dan. All right, that's fair. Best hit you think of your career? Is there one you're like, oh, that was perfect? Oh man, I, it's a lot. I mean, there's you have a lot to a choose lot. from. Um. No, I got Drew Brees really good in the pocket once. I got – I remember hitting uh, Brad Johnson when he was a quarterback for Minnesota in the year I won Defensive Player of the Year. So that would have been 2006. Six, six sorry. Six. six, yeah, six. I got him really good. They had a tight end try to block me, and I ran through his ass. The only thing is the ball came out. The only problem is I went to celebrate too early and didn't pick the football up. So I still pissed off about that to this day, but <laughs> I, lit, I lit his ass up pretty good. Listen, what you just said is so true because I, I have found in talking to so many great athletes, they remember the things they didn't do way oh, yeah. more than the things that you did, right? Like oh, you yeah. always you always think about the one thing that, that got away as opposed to all the things that came your way. Yep. It, it, it's, yeah. yeah. To this day, there's there's so many things I'm like, why, why did that game, that play I just told you about, like the ball was on the ground. I already scored once that game. There was nobody in front of me. I could have picked the ball up and scored again. Two touchdowns in a game. Get out of here. But I, I blew it. I was too busy celebrating. 
Was there another? Was there one quarterback you'd like to go back and hit one more time just because he ticked you off? Um, you know, Philip Rivers talks a lot, man. Philip Rivers <laughs> talks a lot. That sounds about he talks right. a lot, and you always want to get him on the ground. You know, but I, I tell everybody, listen, I don't discriminate against quarterbacks. They all taste like chicken. I like hitting them all. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> and lastly. You were a runner-up on your season with Dancing with the Stars. Was <laughs> I there we were any? This. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, no. That that was great. I remember you came out with the eye black one time to dance. <laughs> was there anything about football that prepared you for Dancing with the Stars? Uh, <clears throat> one thing, being coachable. That was it. Yeah. Um, the rest of it, football and dancing in a ballroom, or I, I think exclusively or mutually exclusive events, mutually exclusive events, and it just. It was so hard. It was you use muscles and parts of your body you never really knew you had or or were important. But the coaching part, you know, being able to grind it out and, and practice, you know, you practice on Dancing with the Stars, you set your own schedule. So you can practice for 30 minutes a day, it's gonna show on live TV, or you can practice 10 hours a day and, and get the results. I always practice eight to ten hours a day and I was killing her, but I was I was used to grinding and being coachable. So that was the one thing that translated. Well, listen, if there's one thing we learned for this entire episode, it's you were always open to someone telling you what you needed to do to be great. And you certainly listened because you were great. Um, I enjoyed working with you briefly when we were together. I always enjoy catching up with you. I, I love being there when you were uh, announced uh, and you got inducted into the hall. Uh, always good to catch up with you, my friend. Thanks for being a part of this. And uh, hopefully it won't be too long before we talk again, okay? Yeah, man. Thanks, thanks a lot for having me. And, and as you said, I, I, I did that one year at ESPN and you were a pleasure to be around a pro's pro. And again, looking at guys like yourself that are, that are so good at what they do, help me down the road and, you know, help me develop and, and understand what it takes to be great in, in, you know, in any situation, in any, any walk of life. So I appreciate your time, your, your professionalism, and you're a good dude, man. You're a cool dude. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Ah, oh, shut up. All right. We'll talk to you later. Get out of here. All right, once again, thanks to Jason. I really did enjoy working with him in our brief time together at ESPN, and obviously he's gone on to do great things. That's it for this week's show, but coming up next week, we'll be joined by a two-time Masters champion who was very emotional both times he was able to put on that green jacket. That conversation is with Bubba Watson. That's next week. We'll see you then.